Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is a self-made woman who is the co-founder and CEO of the highly successful online marketplace called Dawanda. And here she is, Claudia Helming. Claudia, Happy to. thank you <coughs> for coming to us today here at Talking Thanks. Germany. Yeah, great stuff. Now, Dawanda has been described as Europe's largest online marketplace for unique and handmade items. It has over two million active members and provides a platform for no fewer than 150,000 designers. What's more, it's still expanding. So I think we can very much look forward to hearing what Claudia has to tell us uh, about her life as an online entrepreneur and about life in general. Claudia, first question, very <clears throat> important. Have you started thinking about your Christmas shopping yet? Yes. You're one of those people who, you're very organised and you have lists that you begin sometime late in summer, yeah? No, um, well, I start thinking about Christmas mm -hmm. sometime in October. Sometime in October. Yes, and mm -hmm. I start thinking, like, um, I should get organised now um, <laughs> and be different this year. Ah. <laughs> Not make the same mistake as last year. You, you know the reason why I'm asking you, of course, because it was, a, a, as I understand it, it was uh, frustrations yes. around Christmas shopping. Yeah that initially led to the founding of your company, Dawanda. Yeah? Tell exactly. me more. Yeah? Exactly. So um, initially, we really created Dawanda just um, for ourselves. Um, because um, when we came up with the idea, or when we decided actually for the idea of doing Dawanda, um, me and my colleague Michael... Mm -hmm. um, your co-founder. My co-founder, yeah. exactly. We used to work in Moscow for another internet company. And um, we were looking for Christmas presents um, that we could take home for our families. Mm -hmm. um, and they were, of course, expecting some, something quite extraordinary because if you live in what, Moscow, then people, well, they have fantasies of, um, I don't know, extraordinary things. We just have to explain, you were living and working in Moscow at the time, which yeah. we'll talk about again a little bit later, okay? Mm -hmm. So you're looking for Christmas presents in Moscow. Exactly. Yeah? And, um, okay, so our <laughs> Russian was not very good. Uh -huh. um, it still isn't. So we didn't really find anything apart from the typical stuff that you can find on any corner, street corner here, which mm -hmm. is... Um, um, matryoshka, so vodka or some Soviet stuff, so nothing too surprising. Matryoshka, the typical Russian dolls, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the ones you put sort of mm -hmm. one inside the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we decided, okay, let's at least um, give it a personal touch and um, create something ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we decided to, well, sort of make the matryoshkas ourselves. And, um, you made them yourself? Well, it's a way of um, saying it. It's um, we painted our <laughs> painted painted them ourselves. And these are the little fellows who are down here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're the ones you did back then. Yeah. Oh, I see. Because we always ask our guests here on Talking Germany to bring something along, and that's what you brought along today. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The little matryoshkas from back then. Yeah. So as you can see, mm -hmm. um, they were not really suitable as a gift. Yeah. So that's why we still have them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And at that, yeah, but that was at the same time the moment we said, okay, we're quite um, free of any talent um, <laughs> um, regarding crafting and yeah. so on. Yeah. But um, there are people um, who know how to do it and that are very creative and create um, great things that you cannot find on the high street. And um, the only problem is if you don't know them, um, you will not find them. So, um, yeah, and that was the night... Dawanda was sort of born. Okay, let's establish some facts about Dawanda. Mm. The, 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 the diversity of the products you have. Give me an idea mm -hmm. of you know, how broad that diversity is. Mm -hmm. Well, um, basically, any product, in the, or almost any product um, in the world could be hand, or can be handmade. So um, the range is um, very broad, but um, typically we mostly sell, um, or people mostly offer, um, jewelry, fashion, so clothing, stuff for baby and children, toys, mm -hmm. um, decoration, furniture, and so on. So okay. it's, yeah. And you as a businesswoman, you know, it's very important that you know who your customers are. Who are your customers? My customers, um, well, we have sort of the creators and um, we have the buyers. And who are the buyers? Well, um, <laughs> quite similar to uh, <clears throat> the crafters. Um, they are women. Uh -huh. so, mm -hmm. Why? Why are they women? Um, well, um, bizarrely, um, the concept of crafting and DIY, um, yeah, is more it's attractive a woman's to world, women. Yeah, yeah. or has still, been, yeah. yeah, still is. Yeah. Well, yeah, in a way, but um, I mean, <clears throat> the image has changed. So mm. crafting is not like um, 
it's not comparable um, to what your grandmother did. No, no. Um, so it's really something very trendy today and nobody's calling it actually crafting anymore. Everybody's mm -hmm. calling it DIY, so do it yourself. Okay. And um, yeah. There we go. It's not just a real treasure trove. It's a very successful business. Yeah, it's a very interesting business. But there's something, uh, something that I don't understand about it. Something, there's something idealistic about it. This idea of a community. What's all that about? Mm -hmm. Well, idealistic, yes, in a way it is, um, because obviously we sort of believe that um, mm, it's the better way to consume um, products and things. So you want to make a good consumer out of me. Um, you are a good consumer. Oh, good. <laughs> That's the good news for today. <laughs> no. Uh -huh. um, no, but um, I think, um, well, obviously I believe that um, it's um, fairer to um, actually distribute um, the buying power to many people instead of only very few brands and mm -hmm. companies. Okay. Um, and um, obviously it's also quite idealistic to help people um, to sort of fulfill their dreams or be able to um, yeah, create their own companies. Um, okay, so there you're talking about the, the suppliers, yeah. yeah? Sure. And the suppliers are everything from what? Mm -hmm. From one man, one woman businesses mm -hmm. right through to what's at the other end of the spectrum? Um, well, it's um, they're everything about hobby crafters, so mm -hmm. who are just passionately knitting at home in front yeah. of the TV. Yeah. Um, well, it's not only that, it's also people who, who love to sew things for their um, children or, or who just do that as a hobby, but really passionately. Mm -hmm. um, up to people who really do it professionally, who mm -hmm. have um, maybe a small company um, with... I would say the biggest company we have on Davanda right now is a company with maybe 15 people. Okay. Um, yeah. And um, but they started as two, oh, yeah. and they started on the platform. So mm -hmm. um, this can happen. It doesn't happen that often that um, they go that big as 15 people. So you've um, helped them to create jobs, in effect. In a way, yeah. 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 Great stuff. Um, Seven thousand new products each day. Mm -hmm. There's 50,000 new products a week, more or less, yeah? yeah. How, how, does, how does that work in terms of quality control? Mm. No? Um, well, obviously, um, with 7,000 products per day, um, we do not have the time to control them all because then we would need, I don't know how many people to do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, but the beauty of our platform is really the community, which is a very active and engaged community. And um, so obviously they are very interested in keeping actually the marketplace sort of clean and healthy. So they check much more um, than we can do actually if the um, products offered are handmade. Um, or if any, anything is wrong. And in case it is, they report it and then we react on that. So the buyers are the controllers, in effect, mm. yeah? Mm, the buyers and the makers are both the controllers. OK. Yep. And have you had... I mean, you could have people... The, the, there is the risk that you could have people uh, producing products unethically, using yep. child labour yep. or whatever. You must have had cases like that. What, tell um, me about cases <laughs> that have been detected. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, we had cases um, where actually um, had sellers from China. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, to be very honest, actually in China everything is handmade as well, because but just with um, smaller hands mm -hmm. and not in the same spirit yeah. um, as here. And um, so this and um, well, then we told the person that it's not possible to sell the products here because um, they need to be handmade and handmade with a certain spirit. Mm -hmm. And um, the person sort of insisted that she did it um, like that. Mm -hmm. And um, she kept on sending photos um, that were taken anywhere that should reflect that it's really um, a heartful business and yeah. everything. And um, then actually one of our um, employees was in China and um, in the uh, same city. Uh, uh. And we thought, OK, let's check that out. Maybe it's really true. And um, they tried to find her, but obviously the address was wrong. And um, so it was just a fake. And she got the red card. She yeah. was banned from trading yes. through Dawanda. Yep. Okie dokie. Um, can you remember the time before the internet? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting. I mean, for, it, it's interesting for somebody like me because mm. uh, you know we're probably of a slightly different generation. For me, in my life, there was you know there was a time before the internet, and there's the time after the internet became such a great tool and a marketplace mm -hmm. and what have you. Well, when I look at the people who work for you, mm -hmm. yeah, they're all people who are of that generation. They've grown up with the internet. 
isn't it? Mm, yeah, mostly yes. Yeah, that was pretty much how you are as well. I mean, you started, you you, you went to university, you studied mm. Romance languages, mm -hmm. as we say, it, 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 Italian and French yep. and tourism. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have a plan back then or did you not have a plan? You're smiling. <laughs> Well, I had a plan to yeah. not become a teacher uh -huh. <laughs> um, and not uh, and to not become um, a writer or author or something. But, yeah. um, and I had a plan that I wanted to work um, in real business and mm -hmm. um, that's it. And um, um, no, I did not really have a plan knowing that um, I wanted to create a company or anything. Okay, and tell me about the moment when you realised the dot-com field mm -hmm. was the field you wanted to be working in. What was the appeal for you? Yeah, this was a magic moment. Uh -huh. um, yeah, mm -hmm. because um, even during my studies, I used to uh, work quite a lot uh, mm -hmm. for different companies. Yeah. And um, back at the time, I was always thinking, okay, Claudia, I'm not sure that you're ever going to have a job because um, it's just not a possible. proper job, as no. the people say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, so then actually the internet came along uh -huh. and um, I was very, very fascinated and I found that job um, with one of the first portals that launched um, in Germany, mm -hmm. um, Travel Portal, and yeah. Um, yeah, since then I stayed with the, with the internet um, industry. And what I um, just extremely liked was the fact that you could do everything. Mm. So at that time there were no experts for internet, so everybody was um, at the same level, yeah. um, just hungry, curious and somehow excited. And um, yeah. You're being very modest because, I mean, your career took off very fast. I mean, I wrote it down. You were head of operations, independent consultant, director of business development in London and Moscow, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, do you work hard, very hard or too hard? <laughs> <laughs> um, there is no too hard, um, <laughs> I would say. Um, I can work very, very hard. Mm -hmm. um, I can work hard and yeah. I can also be sometimes a bit lazy, so, but... Um, you can be lazy. Yeah. I'm um, relieved to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, your business is a business that it's all, it, it all happens online. Mm -hmm. So you could have your headquarters anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. You chose Berlin. Yeah. Why? Because, um, no, well, for, for many reasons. So um, when we decided that we wanted to create Tawanda, it was quite clear that we wanted to do that in our mother country, so at home, um, so Germany. And um, in Germany, there was only one place I wanted to live, which was Berlin, mm -hmm. um, for many reasons, um, because it's, um, yeah, just love the city, like the city, and um, much more than any other German city. And then, of course, um, when we started here, actually quite a few companies, internet companies, were starting as well. And um, today there are even more internet companies starting in Berlin. And it's sort of really the center, the internet um, hub in, in, in Europe. Absolutely. OK, we'll talk about all that and more. Uh, I've got a very interesting quote for you, and the quote is this. It's a crazy green field. It's chaotic and there are a lot of creative people. That was how one venture capitalist recently described Berlin. Uh, and it's comments like that that have uh, even prompted people to start talking about the city as a German Silicon Valley. Is that over the top? Is it hype? We have this report. Internet startups are booming in Berlin. People are founding online companies like never before. And no idea is too bizarre. My Ashram offers yoga courses on the internet. Get Amen is an offbeat opinion sharing website. And then there's Buddy Beers. The aim of Buddy Beers is to give friends the opportunity to treat other friends in other cities to a beer. A beer in a real bar. It remains to be seen whether sending beer online will catch on, but a brewery has already invested in the idea. Not all the startups in the area have that much luck. German investors willing to take risks are still few and far between. Christophe Mayer, a French businessman and investor, knows about the problems involved. It's a fact that right now there are many more interesting companies in this city than there are professional investors. That drives many of the companies I'm involved with to get funding from London or even the U.S. Money from the U.S. for startups in Berlin? That's new. Until now, American ideas were just imitated. 
Berlin was condescendingly called the copycat capital. What was successful in the US was recreated in Berlin and then sold. But that's set to end. People are now daring to go on the market with their own ideas. Berlin is a relatively cheap place to live. That attracts innovative company founders from abroad. Take SoundCloud, a kind of showcase for musicians. Its founders were able to collect more than $13 million in capital, most of it from abroad. A shining example for the Berlin startup scene. There's a second wave of innovative companies growing up here. Many small plants, so to speak, are germinating and grow into large firms like Google. But not every idea catches on. You have to have the courage to fail. You learn the most from failure. In other countries, Berlin is considered a small, slightly offbeat daughter of California's Silicon Valley. Startup founders from around the world are hearing the signals coming from the German capital and busily working on new internet revolutions, hoping to create a new Google, this time made in Berlin. Mm, a new Google made in Berlin. B uh, Berlin, Europe's Silicon <coughs> Valley. Is it hype or is it reality? You know. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I tell you, it's real. It's um, real? It's real. Well, yeah. that's, that's good news yeah. too, yeah? Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. It's My city is true. going to be the next Silicon Valley, yeah, or already is. It definitely is the Silicon Valley of Europe, yeah. and um, it's catching up faster and faster. Yeah. yeah. How can, uh, give me some evidence for that. Yeah. Okay, um, well, um, I don't have the figures in mind, but yeah. um, it's definitely um, years ago. Um, for example, there used to be much more startups in London and innovation come, was driven rather from London than yeah. from Germany. Mm -hmm. And today, um, I don't know how many companies or internet companies have started in Berlin, but um, think of the ones like Zalando or Coupon that are really um, enormous today. Mm -hmm. And um, they're all based in Berlin. And um, there are many, many more small ones. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I think whenever you open the newspapers today, um, there's so many articles about and there's so many events um, mm -hmm. taking place, um, sort of really featuring the industry, the internet industry in Berlin. So, Articles in newspapers and mm -hmm. events are mm -hmm. one thing and small companies are another thing, mm -hmm. yeah? But what we need in Berlin more than anything else is jobs because Berlin has pretty much the highest uh, rate of unemployment in the whole of Germany. Mm -hmm. Is this new thriving sector that you're describing, is it going to create jobs in numbers? It is. Because if you look at, um, well, it, it definitely does. And um, um, if you look at the big companies, internet companies here like Zalando um, or Vuga, um, they employ, well, Zalando, I don't know, between 1,000 or even more than 1,000 or 3,000 people um, today, which is um, not a small company anymore, so, mm. but um, quite big already. Um, Vuga, several hundred people, for example. So... Um, of course, it's not the big, big industries who employ like 20,000 people, but yeah. um, um, I think already something like 1,000 people is quite amazing. Why do, why do internet companies have such odd, strange <laughs> names? <laughs> <laughs> why aren't they called after the people who founded them? Why isn't your company called Helming and Putz or whatever? Yeah, yeah it's not so sparkling as the wonder, okay. I think. Personally. Short, easy answer. Yeah. Uh, if so many jobs are being created, if there's a Silicon Valley in the making out there, right outside this studio, why, I've got another quote from the startup scene, it's easy here in Berlin, says somebody from the startup scene, it's easy to build a great international team in Berlin, I think we'd agree on that, but if you want the funding, you have to go elsewhere. Is that true? Yes, no, but... Um, so, um, yeah, well, it's true if you want to have, let's say, um, still Silicon Valley or California there, they do receive much more money or there's much more money, money involved to much better conditions mm -hmm. um, than it is possible in Europe or in Berlin, in Germany. So um, Germany has and had to catch up um, for the last five years and is still catching up. We're not at the same level, um, but it's getting better and better. And um, the best proof is that actually um, US investors who are 
really the big ones. The heavyweights, uh, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. um, are coming to Berlin. Um, mm -hmm. And for example, we do have a US investor, mm -hmm. which is still quite rare um, mm -hmm. here in Germany, but it's coming more and more. And um, so, yeah, it's developing. You were talking about the excitement of setting up the kind of company mm -hmm. that you have set up. Now you've got a heavyweight US mm -hmm. investor moving in. What kind of mm -hmm. compromises are you having to make in terms of your own identity? <laughs> <laughs> None. Um, None. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, I mean, we had investors before, so um, German investors, an English investor, and also a French investor. And um, so far, I would say the game hasn't changed. So yeah. it's like um, you're not giving up identity or something. They're not telling you you have to be like this and that. So um, they invested obviously in the idea, and the idea is pretty clear. It's um, sort of also a social idea. And not only a money-making idea, so um, and they know that, so this is not the thing now. So in short, they're saying to you, Claudia, get on yeah. with it. It works. No, well, I have to make it happen as you have well. To make it so happen. as long as um, I would say the figures are okay, um, obviously they're much more relaxed um, than if they are not. So. Okay. When we talk about the uh, the big guns moving in, it's interesting because in that report the question was more or less asked. Uh, there has been, in, in Berlin, we haven't yet seen a, a big flagship mm -hmm. digital company like Google or Skype emerge here in mm -hmm. Berlin. That's what mm -hmm. the city maybe really needs. That's what mm -hmm. the industry really needs. Is it going to happen? Um, well, how often does it happen that actually a Google or a Facebook come to the market? Um, mm. It's a question I would rather ask. It's not yeah. happening every... There's no Google... There's not 20 Googles per year. Yeah. So um, it's quite something if a Google um, comes up or a Facebook um, is born. So, And um, this re revolutionizes the world. So um, I would say we need to take it step by step. Mm. And that's, what is hap uh, that's what's happening. Mm. And I think for um, ideas like Facebook and Google to, to fly... <clears throat> we're probably not yet, we don't have the conditions yet, I think, because okay. it's, but it's, we're getting there. A little bit um, you're giving me this good news about Berlin being a, a, a Silicon Valley in the making, about all the mm. startups and the jobs that are being created. Uh, I read a recent edition of The Economist magazine mm -hmm. uh, comparing, you know, the, the lives of entrepreneurs here in Europe mm -hmm. and, and, and in, in the US. Mm -hmm. And, and I must say, I was shocked by one figure. In that article, it said 50,000 Germans currently live in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. 50,000. What does that tell us about Germany? Well, <laughs> um, well, we like to travel. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> nah, um, well, of course... Um, it's a lot of innovative people who must have left Germany and they must have had their reasons. Sure, um, they had their reasons and um, I can understand them. And of course, Silicon Valley is still um, the, that's what we would like to be yeah. um, one day. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a big example um, of how it should work. Um, and of course, it's easier to, to get your own company or to get a company or create innovative um, business models um, in Silicon Valley than it is in Germany or in Berlin mm -hmm. or in Europe. So that's a fact. Um, yeah, so I guess that's why. Okay. Uh, let's move away from California, come back to, uh, to Germany, Bavaria. You come from Bavaria, yeah? Mm -hmm. Are you a typical Bavarian lady? <laughs> I can be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, stop there, yeah? <laughs> You'll tell me what that means in just a second. Uh, w Claudia comes from Bavaria. And when I say she uh, comes from Bavaria, I'm only really telling you half the story because she comes from a very special uh, small town close to the Austrian border called Marktl, uh, which just happens to be the birthplace of Pope Benedict XVI. Marktl, once a sleepy village in Upper Bavaria, has truly flourished since a German was elected Pope in 2005. It has 2,700 residents and more than 45 times as many tourists. The reason? Pope Benedict was born here in 1927 as Josef Aloysius Ratzinger. He was born in this room. His parents got to know each other through a Lonely Hearts ad. His father was a village policeman and the family was deeply religious. Josef Ratzinger lived here for only two years. Then his father was moved to another town. But that makes no difference to the people of Martel. 
It's lucky for us that he was born here in Marktel. More than 100,000 tourists come here each year. It's great, because otherwise it's so boring. The whole world is coming to Marktel. If you look around here as I do every day, you see cars from all over Germany. On his visit to Germany in 2006, the Pope even stopped here briefly. And suddenly the world's eyes were on Marktel. The grateful village will never forget that. And of course, the enterprising villagers want a profit from the association. Pope Benedict chocolate cake, papal cookies and marzipan miters. The edible souvenirs are best sellers in Markel. There's even a Pope beer on offer. Somehow, beer and Bavaria belong together no matter what. So what do you prefer, the Benedict beer or the Benedict chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> I always buy the beer when I go there and drive home. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You're a beer drinker. Mm -hmm. Is that one aspect of your Bavarian mm. identity? Probably, yeah. <laughs> tell, me, tell me another. <laughs> you were hinting earlier, yeah? No, 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 no. No, no it's um, whatever you imagine as a Bavarian quality. Okay, okay. Mm. Is Markel a small town or a big village? <laughs> it's a um, small village. Small village. It's a medium village, medium-sized village, I would say. Was it a boring place to grow up? <clears throat> well, I think as a child, you don't really feel that any place is boring because um, everything is exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I got older, obviously I moved quite quickly to mm -hmm. Munich or to a bigger city. Otherwise, yeah, I think it uh, would have been quite a boring place. I don't, I don't want to be unfair to Markle, but there was yeah. the lady in the report who said that, uh, <laughs> that it, it's not as boring as it used to be because all these visitors are coming. Uh, how would you describe the people of Markle? <laughs> let's, let's get a map in here while you're describing <laughs> the people of this region. How would you describe okay. them? Well, it's a um, typical Bavarian village. Mm -hmm. um, so there are many young families with, with small children. Um, and whenever I think um, normally <clears throat> they go and buy a house there, they will stay there mm -hmm. till the end of their lives. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, I don't know. They're quite normal people. Do you, When you say normal, do you mean traditional? Not really traditional, mm -hmm. what you would imagine. Um, but... Um, maybe a little bit conservative. Yeah. Mm, that's what I'm getting at, a little bit, because that is the image that people have of... Uh, Bavaria is viewed as sort of one of the more conservative parts of Germany, especially when it comes to the role of women, sometimes at least. Yeah, I don't want to generalise too much. Uh, it's interesting because you, as you indicated, you broke away, you went away. <clears throat> Yeah? And not too long ago, you, uh, you appeared on a list of the top 100 women in technology. Yeah? Um, that's impressive. That's good. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But it's the fact remains that still there are very, very few women in your branch. Yep. Yeah? Why? I don't know. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> Normally, um, people ask me um, to tell them, um, how does it feel um, to create a company as a woman? And I always answer like, I don't know, because I've never been a man and I didn't do it as a man. Um, but um, I don't really understand why um, there are so few women um, in our industry really um, creating companies, mm -hmm. because I think there's no reason. Um, well, I think there are many reasons why women in, in general are not um, founding companies as much as men. But um, I think there's no specific reason why there are so few um, women only in the technology sector. Mm. Um, at least none that I can imagine or understand. Because um, as I described it before, I think it's still um, a very good industry um, to create something without having to invest um, money heavily in the beginning. Um, it's a very investment-friendly um, industry, yeah. but, and um, it's a very, still a very, very young industry. So um, it's still defining itself, which gives you somehow the biggest flexibility you can have. So it's not like you have um, heavy competition on every field. So you can still be one of a few doing something similar. Um, and there are only few industries where you have this privilege, for example. And um, so I do not really understand it. I think it's not because women think they can't do it because it's technology, um, because I'm no IT guru neither. Mm -hmm. um, 
business mm. rather. Mm. Um, so I don't know exactly. There are some sad and some encouraging stories at the same time in that report. Uh, lots of problems with families and poverty and schools. What kind of initiatives have you been involved in, Claudia, with Asha? Mm -hmm. um, well, I obviously started it in the very beginning. So um, what we've been doing is quite a few workshops. So I participated in the workshops mm -hmm. or I did also a few myself. Um, which was quite an experience sometimes. So, um, what was the what were the what was the aim of the workshops? Um, well, the aim of the workshop is actually um, to give children of different ages the possibility to, well, get crafty again. Because today, okay. well, or um, at my time, we still had craft workshops at school. Mm -hmm. um, so something that doesn't happen too often anymore today. Um, and at home, these peop uh, kids don't really have the chance to. To produce something so but the aim was really um, actually um, to sort of give them the possibility to experience that um, happy feeling actually um, that you get when you produce something a product from A to Z and really finish it and mm -hmm. um, so this was the aim of it uh, it's the major aim of what we're doing so um, well we give them courses and just gift um, creating gifts for example bracelets or how to make t-shirts how to make um, the stamps for the t-shirts how to um, I don't know paint comics and stuff like that yeah. so mm -hmm. um, really different things and um, I would say um, they really, really like it and um, they're very enthusiastic about it, um, and which is really something yeah, that makes us, again, very happy. And uh, you're talking about the kids there. What about you when you're in this kind of situation? What, what, what are you thinking? Because, I mean, for many of our viewers, it must be astonishing to hear that child poverty mm -hmm. in what is a rich country mm -hmm. is, a, is, a, is a problem mm -hmm. and a growing problem. Mm -hmm. What, what do you think when you're confronted with this mm -hmm. situation? Um, well, <laughs> it is, well, of course, um, it sometimes is quite shocking um, because even if you hear about child poverty, it's something that is still quite far away. Um, it's in Germany, it's in your city, um, but it's still, it's far away as it's, um, I don't know, in areas that you're not going that often, you don't see it that often, yeah. you just hear from it, but it stays abstract. And um, once you're there, um, you just really feel um, what that, what it really means, what it means for kids. And um, so, for example, um, the aggressiveness of um kids already in the age of five or six, which is just enormous, um, total lack of um, being able to concentrate on something and just, for example, learning to, to write or to read. Um, it's nothing that is an exemption, but it's rather um, quite regular there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, all I can say, Claudia, is good for you for making mm -hmm. a contribution. Yeah, great stuff. I'd like to have heard more, but that's all we've got time for there. We go, we're go. we going to move on to our traditional Talking Germany quiz at the end of the programme. Um, first question I'd like to ask you is, um, if you were to offer a homemade product on your site, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> if I had to do it, OK. Um, uh, then it would be cross-stitched um, towels. OK, that's a good one, yeah. Uh, which is home for you, Bavaria or Berlin? Berlin. Berlin. And is Berlin, as its mayor once famously said, a quote that has gone round the world, poor but sexy, or is it a commercial powerhouse in the making? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, Berlin is not that poor anymore, um, <laughs> but it's... Um, it's a sexy powerhouse in the It's making. a sexy powerhouse. That's good. That is a good quote. Yeah. Uh, last one I think we've got time for. Business is about making money or making a contribution? Both. I knew you'd say both. Yeah. And you're so right. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that is all we've got time for here on Talking Germany with the uh, charming and thoughtful Claudia Helming. To find out more still, visit my blog on our website. And if you've enjoyed the show as much as I have, then do come back next week. Until then, bye-bye and tschüss. <laughs>